Uh, thank you to the Pointer Institute for sponsoring this talk and uh, the other talks that I think are part of it. Um, and thank you to Yale for hosting this event uh, and for educating me. As you heard, I am, in fact, a, uh, an alum. And finally, I'd like to give a very special thank you to James Sneed, a professor of literature uh, here at Yale. He taught me in three courses, and I can assure you not one of them was a gut. Uh, there was a very rigorous survey of the Western literary canon, a seminar on William Faulkner, and another seminar on James Joyce and Thomas Mann. Professor Sneed, or Jamie as he was known to his friends, was incandescent. When I was here, he was one of the only African American professors at Yale. He was a concert level jazz and classical pianist. He was a novelist. And despite all of these and many other attributes, I'm almost certain that none of you know him or have even heard of him. And there's a reason for that. James Sneed died 22 years ago at age 35 of AIDS. HIV is scientifically classified as a lentivirus, literally a slow virus. An untreated HIV takes about 10 years to kill patients. And it also spreads much more sluggishly than, say, measles or the flu. Even South Africa, which suffered a veritable HIV blitzkrieg, it took HIV about 10 years to saturate the South African population. The AIDS epidemic first discovered 30 years ago among five homosexual men in Los Angeles rolls through the world in decades. And it is from that perspective that control of this epidemic is finally in sight. For the first time ever, we have the tools to gain the upper hand on HIV and to constrict the torrent of new infections to a trickle. We have the public health tools to do this in Africa, where AIDS is at its worst. In effect, we can transform AIDS into a manageable health product, pro a problem, ending it as an epidemic. Let me just repeat that. We can end AIDS as an epidemic. We can do that now with the tools we already have. Yes, an AIDS vaccine is absolutely important, and it will be the ultimate weapon. It will perhaps, in fact, even probably, allow us to eradicate HIV from the planet. But we do not have to wait the years or possibly decades until we have a vaccine. We have the tools now. And every day that the world delays deploying these tools, the epidemic swells, and so it becomes harder and more expensive to gain control of the epidemic. And yet I find, or have found, that many people who work in HIV do not fully grasp the astonishing opportunity that science has granted to us. And so I'd like to explain this revolution. And in so doing, I'd like to discuss at least a little bit the interplay between research, journalism, and activism. A little bit of history. Back in 1989, when Professor Sneed died, there were very few drugs approved to treat AIDS, and they were useless. As most of you know, HIV is very mutable, so it can easily evolve to escape one or even two of the drugs. The drugs, by the way, are called antiretroviral drugs. In 1996, a decade and a half, into the epidemic, researchers proved that a cocktail of three antiretroviral drugs put up such a high barrier that HIV could rarely mutate to become drug resistant. Those three drug cocktails did not and do not cure AIDS, but they paralyzed the virus and stop its destruction of the immune system. So starting from 1996, death rates in rich countries plummeted. And over the last several years, because of an unprecedented effort led by activists, many of whom have HIV themselves, those life-saving drugs are finally reaching Africa. According to UN estimates, about 34 million people around the world are living with HIV. Of those, roughly two-thirds, or 22.5 million, live in sub-Saharan Africa. Of those, 
22.5 million Africans, more than 10.6 million need treatment now. And that means that the disease in their body has progressed to the point where they meet the World Health Organization uh, requirements or guidelines for treatment. And for most of those 10.6 million, the virus has weakened their immune system to the point where they are in imminent danger of acquiring TB or some other opportunistic infection that will kill them. So of those 10.6 million treatment, people who need treatment now, how many are getting it? Unfortunately, the UN estimates only go through 2009. So I did some back of the envelope, very rough calculations or extrapolations. And I would say that today, somewhere between five and a half and six and a half million Africans probably have access to HIV treatment. This is clearly not enough. 10.6 million need it. But it is a jaw-dropping, just a jaw-dropping achievement. I remember back in 1996 when the World AIDS Conference was held in Vancouver and a prominent researcher held up a glass of water and said if this were the cure for AIDS, no one in Africa would ever get it. His comment shows that what experts once thought was impossible can be possible and in fact today is a fact on the ground. But despite all of the progress, one fundamental problem has stubbornly refused to go away. More people get infected with HIV than die of AIDS, so the epidemic continues to grow. In 2009, again the most recent year for which there are statistics, 2.6 million people worldwide contracted HIV. In Sub-Saharan Africa, 1.8 million got HIV, while 1.3 million died. So the total number of people with Africa, grew, total number of people with HIV in Africa grew by half a million. Now each one of those people, of course, represents a tragedy, anguish, grief, the shame that often accompanies, unfortunately, getting HIV because it's a sexually spread disease. But those patients also represent money. The more people who get infected, the more money Africa will need to treat them. And remember, if no one else ever got infected with HIV in Africa, we would still need to more than triple the number of people in Africa on treatment. Because at most, a little under 7 million Africans are on antiretrovirals, but at least 22.5 million people already have HIV. If Africa cannot dramatically shrink the number of new infections, the United States and other wealthy countries that are subsidizing treatment for Africa are likely to see AIDS as an intractable, insoluble problem, a hopeless money drain. And they are likely to cut back their already precarious funding. That's especially likely in our current economic and political climate. Now, it's true that rates of new infections in many African countries are leveling off or dropping. But even so, far too many Africans are still getting infected. And the plain fact is that until very recently, our prevention tools for adults were the same as they were when I was at Yale taking courses from Professor Sneed. Safer sex, education. Now, such education and all the behavioral prevention programs that go with it are crucial. Without them, the epidemic would be unimaginably worse. They must be continued. They must be intensified. But the definition of insanity is doing the same thing and expecting different results. And it is insane to think that in an impoverished region where women often do not have the power to control sex, where a host of factors such as other STDs and other infections increase the likelihood that a person will contract HIV, that continuing with the same behavioral infections will curtail the epidemic, it will not. That's especially true for a simple and wonderful fact. The AIDS drugs, which are now flowing into Africa, keep people alive. So the number of people who are dying of AIDS, thank God, is diminishing. And that means that prevention has to be better than it ever has been. 
to bring the number of newly infected people down below the number of deaths. Behavioral interventions are necessary, but they are not sufficient. Fortunately, we have new tools. I'll discuss what I think are the three most important tools for Africa. The first is male circumcision and circumcision cuts to, pardon the pun, the risk that a man will acquire HIV by about two-thirds. The results of the first ever randomized controlled clinical trial of male circumcision on HIV acquisition, which was conducted by Bertrand Auvert in Orange Farm, South Africa, were first reported in that well-known peer-reviewed scientific journal, The Wall Street Journal. I had uh, managed to obtain a copy of the manuscript with all the data, and my colleagues and I broke the news of what I still consider to be one of the most important clinical trials in the history of HIV. And we ran the story because the trial was good science. If that study had been observational, if it hadn't been randomized, if the results didn't achieve statistical significance, we wouldn't have bothered reporting on it especially because I was on vacation at the time that I got this uh, manuscript. In an epidemic, political leadership is important. Money is important. Culture is important. Activism is important. And good journalists write about all of it. But at its core, an epidemic is a scientific problem. Research matters. What you do at the Yale School of Public Health, what you do at the Center for Interdisciplinary Research on AIDS matters. Dr. Overe's publication was followed by two confirmatory studies out of Kenya and Uganda. But despite three large, randomized, controlled clinical trials all showing that circumcision protects men against HIV, almost nothing has happened. Yes, Kenya has circumcised a pretty large proportion of its uncircumcised men, but they're almost alone, really. A 2009 U.S. government study looked at 14 hard-hit African countries and estimated that circumcision could prevent a fifth, 20%, of new infections that would have incurred by 2025. But to achieve that, 39 million males would need to be circumcised before the end of 2015. I've not been able to find someone or an organization that keeps track of how many African men have been circumcised to prevent AIDS. But the experts I've spoken to, their back of the envelope uh, calculations are well less than 2 million, probably at the most 1 million, which is barely 2.5 to 5 percent of what needs to be done in those 14 key countries. And in this case, the problem is not money. That same government study estimated that the cost would peak at only $425 million a year and then shrink to 125 to continue uh, uh, circumcising babies. Nor is the problem that African men will not get circumcised. The Luo people in Kenya, who traditionally don't circumcise, have flocked to the procedure. And recently in South Africa, the king of the Zulus and other people who do not traditionally circumcise has urged uh, his tribesmen to get circumcised. Many African groups do circumcise as a rite of passage into manhood. And so because of urban mixing and labor migration trees with manliness, and many men and women simply prefer the look. I will always remember uh, this Kenyan man uh, whose circumcision I witnessed in 2007 after the doctor had finished, he looked down and he said, look at that NASA rocket. <laughs> so why haven't more African men been circumcised? And part of the answer is a lack of political will. Even as recently as last year, a prominent U.S. activist told me that he refused to advocate for circumcision because as a white American, he found it too charged to recommend that black African men lop off a part of their penis. Now look, that is a real issue. But it can be handled with tact, humility, and persistence. Privately, U.S. officials tell me of very delicate negotiations with African political leaders, negotiations they've had to carry out virtually alone. American officials are furious 
that other donor nations have been slow to pony up and slow to help them in these negotiations. Of course, there are some African countries that don't need to wait for some American or some European or some donor country to uh, advise them to do something. Swaziland, with US support, is launching a one-year campaign to circumcise 80% of its men. South Africa, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Rwanda, uh, they're all beginning to ramp up their efforts. But the fact remains that one of the most powerful and least expensive interventions, one that could prevent millions of new infections, remains dramatically underutilized. So HIV continues to spread. The second new prevention tool is called a microbicide. This is a gel that contains an antiretroviral drug that women apply to their vaginas before and after sex. In a study last year led by the husband and wife team of Salim and Karisha Abdul Karim, the gel was shown to reduce the chance a woman would get infected by 39%. Now, some people say 39% is a weak result. They're right, and there needs to be a confirmatory study. But to me, as a reporter trying to judge the significance of this trial, the history of AIDS prevention and AIDS research looms very large. The microbicide gel is odorless, colorless, and tasteless. A woman can use it without her male partner even knowing. And that's crucial because women have never before had a prevention method that they alone control. One of the trial sites for this particular clinical trial was rural Vulinlela in South Africa's KwaZulu-Natal province. In that community, more than 44% of women have already contracted HIV when they reach age 22. 22. That is the age, if I recall correctly, when people graduate from Yale. Imagine if more than four in 10 graduating Yale women were infected with HIV. By the time the women in Vulinlela reach 24, which is what, maybe the time you're getting your master's degree, more than 50% are infected. And these statistics are not unusual for Southern Africa. Women there need a prevention method that they control or Africa will not control its epidemic. And yet, I spoke with the leader of South Africa's main organization, the Treatment Action Coalition. She acknowledged to me that the TAC was so focused on getting treatment to ill people who desperately needed it, and so short of resources, that they barely had any program for HIV prevention at all. Another member of the TAC wrote an email to me, said, quote, a bit skeptical of the practical consequences of the microbicide study. 39% is barely good enough for rollout. I'm a bit of a microbicide skeptic, partially for scientific reasons, but admittedly also because of being jaded by the microbicide propaganda machine. Several years down the track and many millions of dollars spent and still no effective, marketable product in sight, end quote. And 39% is not a great result. But that's the overall result. Among women who reported relatively high adherence, efficacy was 54%. Now, the microbicide trial was not the first HIV prevention trial to show that an antiretroviral drug could reduce HIV transmission. Way back in 1994, the AIDS drug AZT was tried to see if it could prevent mothers from passing the virus to their babies in the womb and during childbirth. It worked with an efficacy of about 67%. Today, more powerful drugs and optimized dosing regimens have increased that efficacy to at least 94%. Now, the microbicide trial that showed 39% efficacy was the first ever to show that a microbicide worked. It used what many researchers consider an unwieldy dosing schedule. And the gel itself may not be the best delivery method. 
Already researchers envision a vaginal ring that a woman would have to insert only once a month. And what's more, new research that I've given my word not to discuss is unlocking how one might make the drug more effective at blocking infection. Now, look, as Yogi Berra said, predictions are difficult, especially about the future. But the history of AIDS research leads me to believe that 39% will be the floor, not the ceiling, of microbicide efficacy. That and the desperate need among women for some level of protection that they control is why I pushed to play the microbicide trial on the front page, accompanied on the web by a video and a slideshow. I believed then, and I still believe now, that that study opened up an entirely new vista for HIV prevention. <coughs> Finally, the single most powerful adult HIV prevention intervention other than absolute lifelong abstinence, which is pretty difficult, was proven to work this year. In a large randomized clinical trial, it was shown that when an infected person is taking the three-drug cocktail, he or she is more than 96% less likely to transmit the virus than a person not yet on medication. 96%. I mean, vaccines often don't reach that level of efficacy. No large randomized controlled clinical trials ever been done for condoms and their effect on preventing HIV, but I bet if one were, it would not reach that level of efficacy. It is simply a stunning result. That study also ends the nihilistic and divisive rivalry between prevention on the one hand and treatment on the other. What this study, led by Myron Cohen, proved is that treatment is prevention, and hence the name for this intervention, treatment as prevention. Now, it will be expensive to roll out treatment as prevention and ensuring adherence and affordable second and third and fourth line regimens won't be easy, but the activist David Barr pointed out that treatment as prevention has one undeniable financial incentive. As he said, it's basically free in terms of its prevention impact because you're treating people who would need treatment anyway. Now, I focused on these three interventions, circumcision, microbicide gel, uh, and treatment as prevention. There are other uh, interventions and advances which help, which we maybe can discuss afterwards. The last point about these three interventions is that none of them alone is a panacea. Think about treatment as prevention. Yes, it has a 96% efficacy if you're taking the drugs. But not everybody with HIV will get treated. The virus can mutate and become resistant to HIV. And then if you, even if you are on the drugs, you are still infectious. Some patients just won't take their medication. There is a methamphetamine epidemic in many of the cities of South Africa. Will meth addicts adhere to their HIV medication? Finally. A person is most infectious in the months after they first contract HIV. And these highly infectious, newly infected people might account for anywhere between 10 and 40 percent of new infections. Now, it's extremely difficult anywhere in the world, but especially in poor regions of the world, to find people who have just been infected with HIV. And if you can't find them, you can't treat them. So for all of these reasons, treating people with HIV probably will not, in and of itself, stop the spread of HIV. As for circumcision, not every man will get circumcised. And even those who do are not immune to HIV. They're just much less likely to get HIV. Similarly, not every woman will use a microbicide. And if they do, some will still get infected, even with newer and more improved microbicide products. But if all these interventions were deployed simultaneously and aggressively and on top of robust behavioral interventions, then a patchwork could be created that would give almost everyone at risk a level of biological protection that they have never before had. 
Men would be protected by circumcision, women by a microbicide, and both sexes by treating as many of those people with the virus as is feasible. It's not enough to do just one. One patch is like one antiretroviral drug. It won't do the job. You need to deploy all of them, triple combination therapy, triple combination prevention, all three patches to create this patchwork. And with it, we can envision a sharp, even radical, reduction in the rate of new infections. Estimates that I've seen range anywhere from cutting new infections by half to as much as three quarters. And this is where the slow epidemic idea comes into play. In keeping with the epidemic's slow role, these reductions could build on themselves over time, similar to the way compound interest builds. As fewer and fewer infected people exist to pass on the virus, the absence of those they would have infected, and still others that those people in turn would have infected, can compound to result in a virtuous cycle of ever fewer infections. The self-propagating compound interest effects only start when reductions in new infections reach a tipping point. And even then, they take years to set in. So to get the most bang for our buck and start to end AIDS as an epidemic, we need to start deploying these tools as soon as possible. And that's especially true in Africa, the epicenter of the epidemic. I've focused on Africa, but you don't have to leave the United States to see an urgent need for these interventions. We have a raging epidemic among African Americans who make up a little more than a tenth of the U.S. population, but account for about half of new infections in the United States and about half of AIDS deaths in the United States. The epidemic is especially horrific among gay black men. According to a recent CDC research, rates of infection among gay black men appear to be skyrocketing. Here in New Haven, a city with a large and impoverished black community, treatment as prevention has the potential to help turn the tide on this epidemic. A microbicide could also help, especially if it were proven to work rectally and not only vaginally. In sum, scientifically, we have the tools to contain the AIDS epidemic, a scientific fact that I have tried to trumpet as loudly as I can. Now, this is the point where anecdote, that scourge of science, but that indispensable tool of journalism comes into play. Scientifically, the tools are there, but using them in the real world is just a whole different kettle of fish. For several years, I've followed a South African miner and his wife. When I met them years ago, they were courting. Now they've been married for a few years. From the time I met them, the man knew he was infected, but he refused to tell the woman. He wanted her to know, and he even went to elaborate efforts so that she would find out. He arranged, for example, to have them both tested together at the same time. And I went with them to the hospital. I was with them when they received the post-test counseling or pre-test counseling. I was with them when he rolled up his arm to have the blood drawn. And I was with them when the nurse walked in to say that the hospital had run out of test kits. Meanwhile, the wife clearly did not want to be tested. She consistently refused for years. In fact, I wonder to this day if she didn't secretly persuade the nurse to use running out of test kits as an excuse to get out of being tested. I'll never know, but I'll always wonder. Now, if you don't get tested, you can't get treated. And indeed, countries such as Botswana that offered HIV, free HIV treatment often had trouble getting people to start taking it. And when people start treatment, they sometimes stop. It's a dirty little secret, but first-line regimens in Africa are not as good as those in America. They have more side effects, and therefore they cause a higher dropout rate. Now, my minor never used condoms, as is true of millions of couples throughout the world. But if the woman didn't know her partner was positive, 
would she have used a microbicide? I don't know, but I tend to doubt it. Another issue, my miner smokes a lot of pot. He grows dacha, as they call it in South Africa, on his crawl. And he drinks copious amounts of beer. But at least, like many of his urban countrymen, he does not use methamphetamines. So clearly, there is a lot of operational research for scientists in this room to do. Whatever the obstacles to deploying these new interventions, and there will be obstacles, you need to identify them and figure out ways to deal with them. Because whatever the problems of implementing these new tools, we already know the consequences of not implementing them. This kind of operational research may not be as glamorous as the breakthrough trials I've discussed, but it is crucial. And as for the activists in this room, none of these tools have yet been rolled out at a sufficient rate to control the epidemic, largely, but certainly not only, because money is scarce. In the midst of a global recession, money for AIDS in poor and middle income countries has fallen. Ireland, the Netherlands, Italy have all cut back on their pledges, largely because of the economic crisis. President Obama has so far managed to hold money for global AIDS flat, but he's not kept his promise to raise the amount of money for global AIDS. And implementing treatment as prevention, not to mention microbicides and circumcision, will require not flat funding, but more money. What I'd like to know, and what several teams are now tackling, is whether a massive investment right now might actually save money over the long run by shrinking the growth of the epidemic and reducing the number of people who would need to be treated. If that turns out to be true, that could be a very powerful incentive. We already have evidence that treating people makes overall economic sense. Just last week in PLOS One, there was a study that assessed the cost of maintaining those people who are currently on treatment all the way through 2020. The authors looked at three economic factors. The gains from labor productivity, the deferred medical costs, and the reduced costs of caring for orphans. When you add just those three together, the economic benefits accounted for at least 81% of the cost of maintaining those people on treatment and could give a benefit of almost triple the cost of providing treatment. As the authors put it, these results suggest that the economic benefits of treatment will substantially offset and likely exceed program costs within 10 years of investment. For a slow epidemic, that's a good investment. It may seem impossible to implement these interventions, but we were once told that even if the career were a glass of water, it would be impossible to provide. The impossible is possible, and the impossible is imperative. I just keep thinking about Professor Sneed, who was snuffed out at age 35. He was as brilliant as Harold Bloom, who also taught me when I studied here. Sneed wrote on everything from the influence of Schopenhauer in the novels of Thomas Mann to the racialized meaning of basketball in American popular culture. He was a leader in his church. He's actually buried in an Episcopal church. And he befriended scores of people around the world. Here's what a German man that he met by accident uh, one day wrote about him. A German man is a man named Peter Scheibner. He writes, I was about to hop on the Greyhound bus to San Francisco, and this guy, who turns out to be Jamie, asked me if I was on the right one. He sat next to me, and when we got to talking, he realized I was German. Immediately, he started speaking German, and we had a great conversation about German literature, literature such as Brecht and others. He knew a lot, more than I did. When he went for a pee, an old white guy sitting in front of me turned around and told me to be very careful with the blacks. I should be very suspicious, he warned. A black guy talking in a foreign language can't be any good, and sitting in the first half of the bus is bad behavior. You all remember, of course, that blacks used to be forced to sit in the back of the bus. After almost two days on the bus, we made another stop in Rock Springs, Wyoming. 
The bus driver mumbled something about a 50-minute break, or at least that's what I and even some American passengers understood. But he must have said 15 minutes because when we came back, the bus was gone with all our baggage. We had to wait two hours for the next bus, and I was more than worried about all my lost belongings. When we arrived at the bus station in San Francisco, there was Jamie sitting on a bench with all our baggage waiting for us. In my mind's eye, Jamie Sneed and all the other people that HIV has infected or killed are still waiting. They're waiting, quite frankly, for us to use what we finally have to end the AIDS epidemic. AIDS has killed more than 25 million people. And AIDS is not like cancer, which usually kills those who have lived long lives. After all, HIV is spread through sex. So almost all of those who died were, like Jamie Sneed, in the prime of their lives. Almost every time HIV strikes, it cuts short someone's potential for brilliance, artistry, discovery, and random flourishes of generosity, like holding someone's luggage at a bus station. We should use the new tools to end AIDS as an epidemic not only because doing so makes economic sense and might, over the long, slow arc of the epidemic, save us money, but also because doing so will prevent the virus of robbing us from all the current and future Jamie Sneeds who are waiting for a world without the AIDS epidemic. Thank you.